From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Hello. Welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We are joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you. You are here. And that makes this stuff they don't want you to know. In today's episode, we're revisiting uh, a topic we picked up in 2014, both as a video and as a short audio podcast. Uh, this is uh, this is something that may be controversial to some people. It may be personal to some of us listening today, and we're going to do our level best, as always, to stay objective. We're talking about non-governmental organizations, the street name NGOs. Most of us are vaguely aware of these institutions. And oddly enough, they're defined by what they are not rather than what they actually are. They're just non-governmental. The whole definition is the thing that they are not in the name. And that's tricky because this is an umbrella term. It encompasses everything from, you know, the Red Cross to the Red Crescent to Greenpeace, from the World Wildlife Fund to Oxfam and so many, 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 many more. And typically, these organizations are going to focus on a distinct set of concerns or problems, right? Human rights uh, equality uh, or fighting dysentery, it's usually the kind of stuff every human being can get behind, you know, solving world hunger. It's philanthropy. Yeah, saving the cute animals. Yeah, doing the right thing. I always confuse philanthropy with philandering. Those aren't the same thing, are they? In a way, they both mean lover of men. Oh, that's true. <laughs> Or lover of humanity. It's true. I, I confuse them as well. Uh, NGOs are all about distribution, and it might surprise many of us, uh, especially people who have donated to one cause or another, it might surprise us to learn that NGOs are not as squeaky clean and as utopian as their proponents would have us believe. In fact, many people, a growing number of people, will argue that these institutions and organizations are at the very least disingenuous, maybe even evil. We'll get to that. But first things first, what exactly is this term we're throwing around? What is an NGO? Here are the facts. Our old pals at the Oxford English Dictionary um, have a fabulous definition for what an NGO is. They define it as a nonprofit organization that operates independently of any government, typically one whose purpose is to address a social or political issue. Um, and in fact, the term non-governmental organization was created in Article 71 of the Charter of the United Nations in 1945, uh, and that's when – a select, uh, you know, club, I guess you could call it, of international non-state agencies uh, were given um, observer status to some of, of this body's meetings. Yeah, so that means that – let's just make up an example. Let's just say the Red Cross is now allowed to hang out in the room during meetings that might uh, – might be applicable to its mission, right, to save lives. They don't get to vote because they're not countries. They can maybe make some speeches, right? But the big thing is they do not have voting power. And there are other entities that have observer status in the United Nations. This is different because that select group of uh, organizations and institutions that were allowed to be called non-governmental organizations – were already very, very politically connected. They were already kind of in the room. Now they just get the name drop and the official designation. But again, like you said, Noel, they are addressing social or political issues. The only common factor that these this, this original group had back in 45 was that they were not government agencies and they weren't technically businesses. They weren't making money hand over fist, or if they were, that was a secondary aim. Yeah, well, there isn't the idea that they're nonprofit or not-for-profit right. NGOs. Like, that's the whole, one of the major points. Right. Got it. Right. Uh, now, they can distribute money, 
Yes. I'm very into distribute today. They can distribute money or funding. And, and to, take donations. And take donations, of course, from any number of donors. Uh, but they're not supposed to keep it and roll it over. They're supposed to invest it in their mission. So originally – the UN said, okay, you're, you're going to be uh, advocating for human rights, you're going to be advocating for the environment, or quote-unquote development, another umbrella term that can be very tricky. So an NGO really can be any kind of organization so long as it's uh, ostensibly independent from government influence and, as you said, Matt, is not for profit. There are a ton of them now and they're just going to keep uh, growing. Yeah, if you check out nonprofitaction.org, and this is a group that tracks uh, the stats that, are, that pertain to NGOs, they estimate that there are, listen to this, roughly 10 million non governmental organizations worldwide that are functioning. And uh, I mean, that's a lot, right? You're, if you think about that. And, and as Ben mentioned, they're not out there trying to make profit for things, but they are trying to function and, quote, you know, do good, mm -hmm. do some kind of social good. So they are trying to get in as much money as they can through donations and, uh, as we'll see later, other means. Let's, let's just go to a fact here. In 2011, people donated $1.2 billion to various non-governmental organizations. And then just three years later, by 2014, that number had risen to $1.4 billion. So by 2030, this number is expected to make the meteoric rise up to $2.5 billion. So more than twice what it was in 2011 – they are also huge employers. We're talking about a gigantic mass of people. Uh, two quick examples. There are more than 600,000 NGOs in Australia and their employees make up 8% of the Australian workforce. Wow. 8% does, doesn't sound huge until you think of, you know, the fact that it's the entire nation and continent of Australia. What do you think sets Australia apart? Oddly enough, not not that much. Uh, the NGO industry is huge in the United States as well as Western countries. Part of part of the reason it seems so big is because again, the term has so much leeway. It encompasses so much stuff. You know, one NGO can be doing something entirely different and irrelevant to the uh, aims or activities of another NGO. But get this. If all the NGOs in the world were a country, they would have the fifth largest economy in the world. That's according to John Hopkins. Whoa. So they're here. They're here to stay. They're growing. You know, as, as we pointed out, uh, they are going to be at least a $2.5 billion business within the next, you know, 10 years. And a ton of people worldwide – depend on them both for employment and perhaps for some aspect of their lives, mm -hmm. whether it's from water being treated and cleaned in, in some remote part of the earth or, you know, a shelter being provided and created as in, you know, talking about development. Mm -hmm. On the good side, at least. Uh, yeah, on the good side. <laughs> right. We're throwing, in, we're throwing shade <laughs> already. Yeah. So just yeah. trying to remind everybody that, you know, we, we mentioned at the top here, like, a lot of people think these uh, things are evil in a general sense. Uh -huh. We're just making sure to point out that there is real good that is occurring. Yes. Um, it gets so complicated, we haven't even hit it yet. So maybe we'll save some of this discussion for later. Hashtag not all NGOs. Yes. <laughs> and this becomes incredibly important as we continue because our big question is what do NGOs do? Their activities include, but are not limited to, the stuff we just named, environmental work, advocacy, human rights, uh, social betterment. And sometimes this will happen on a large, somewhat abstract scale, and sometimes it will happen very locally. Like this NGO is just providing this specific type of water pump to a specific region on a continent. Or we're just passing out life straws. That's what we're doing. Life straws are great, by the way. Uh, they're incredibly reasonable if you don't have one. And if you, uh, like me, believe in building go bags for your home or your car, you need a life straw. We should get – we've talked about this. Why don't we have something I want you to know branded life straws? 
I would love that. Then we could talk cool. about that. Maybe we, yeah. maybe we, we came up. So you can like what drink out of like a puddle with one of those. Right? Yes, that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. I would do it just for the novelty of drinking out of a puddle. Yeah. The only I think the only problem is that they can't filter uh, some heavy metals. So uh, according to the latest reports, life straws are not as useful in the continental U.S. as we would have wanted to believe because the pollution is rampant. A different episode. What? No. Oh, man, different episode. So it's a that's a story for a different day, but NGOs are on the front lines in the trenches of combating these problems and making a world in 2085 or a world in 3020 a place where people would still like to live. So the thing is, they're not all created equally, and they have different broad categories. Uh, the two big divisions are what we would call operational NGOs and advocacy or campaigning NGOs. They overlap, but they are different entities. So operational NGOs actually have to mobilize resources in the form of their financial donations, uh, things like raw materials, um, volunteer labor, um, so that they can actually, you know, keep these projects and programs going. It's a really difficult and complex process with a lot of moving parts. And these NGOs usually have some kind of HQ, um, a, a built-in bureaucracy, and all kinds of support and field staff. Then you've got advocacy or campaigning NGOs that carry out kind of similar types of activities, but uh, there's kind of a different balancing act that goes on between them. Uh, you still have to raise money, of course. It's the name of the game for any NGO, but on a much smaller scale. Um, and it serves more of a symbolic function and kind of strengthening uh, the identification with a particular cause that donors might have. I mean, it sort of goes into the whole idea of the uh, – that's not not pure vanity, but there is something of a status symbol involved in participating in some of these NGOs, and this kind of bolsters that. So when you persuade people to donate time, it becomes more valuable. Successful campaigning NGOs have the ability to kind of get large numbers of people to mobilize for very specific issues and uh, types of events. Yeah, the advocacy campaigning NGOs are, think of them as the raising awareness NGOs. Sure. We'll have funding. We want to keep the lights on. It's more important to us that we get people to volunteer X amount of days out of the year, et cetera. And these distinctions, like a lot of on-paper distinctions, get real muddy when we go to the field. Operational NGOs you know, uh, if if the impact of their projects doesn't seem like it's really moving the needle, then they'll go – of course they'll go into campaigning. What are they going to say? No, we don't do that here. Uh, and these operational NGOs, especially the big ones, always run regular campaigns or at least they support – other affiliated organizations that are running campaigns. And then sometimes on the other side, NGOs that are campaigning NGOs feel like they cannot ignore immediate real problems in their policy domain. So like if you are an NGO that wants to raise awareness and support in society for human rights or for women's rights, then you may say, you know, the problem here is happening so blatantly, it's so pervasive, and we have the tools to fix it, so we can't hold off. We can't just have a raise awareness dinner or gala. We need to put the money directly into assisting the victims of these crimes. So they can they can trade back and forth. They're, they're a bit uh, mercurial, a bit chameleon-like. And there are other NGOs that specialize outside of these primary functions, right? Yeah, there's a there's a whole other kind of arm of NGOs called the Research Institute. You've probably heard of these before. They're really great. One of their primary things they do is to increase knowledge and understanding. And these, you know, will range across a whole spectrum, of course, from those, um, you know, who are just looking to promote academics, like the the – uh, non-political issues out there that are going to help our world become a better place to then, you know, sending out information across the world or across a population for campaigning to get more money in, right, to then spread more awareness. So it's kind of just like a nice little cycle there of 
send us some money so we can let other people know this cool thing that you know now, that you know who we are. And think tanks operate in this realm too. Oh, for sure. Right. Seriously, your political affiliation, I know people hate to hear this, but in this in this conversation, your political affiliation does not apply. It does not matter. What we're about to tell you is very true. The majority of the time that a politician has a smart policy plan It didn't come from them because they're typically not going to be professors. It came from think tanks. It came from NGOs. It came from places like ALEC, A-L-E-C. And a lot of times these groups are on the ground somewhere that have the best visibility for a problem or a big issue, right? Absolutely. Which – so it's – we're not saying that's necessarily bad. It's just perhaps a bit disingenuous when you get that uh, messaging from a politician. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Politicians are disingenuous? (laughs) Say it is so. Why? We we kind of – we all know this and we're all jaded to some extent at this point. But it is, I think, good just to know uh, what you were saying, Ben, that these NGOs a lot of times have a heavy hand in policymaking. Absolutely. But I think to to your point, Matt, um, they're able to be more specialized, right? So they can, you know, really have the the smarts specifically to deal with a particular problem like climate change or to really help develop a policy where every aspect has been fully thought out and vetted before, um, you know, these politicians maybe shop around for what they Mm -hmm. consider to be the best uh, form of that plan. And then they go with the one that maybe has the best backing or the most uh, bona fides, right? Right, or what their what their masters allow them to endorse, which I know sounds super cynical, but you're right. It's not a bad thing. It's actually a very, very good thing that politicians lean on this expertise because to your point, Noel, uh, these organizations are more nimble and they will tend to have a, a depth of understanding that can get lost in a big bureaucratic machine. But, okay, so I know we're getting a little in the weeds here. Uh, There is one great hilarious way to think of NGOs and to differentiate them, and it goes like this. Bingo, Ingo, Gongo, Ingo, and, of course, Quango. Love that band. (laughs) Wait, was Ingo twice? Uh, Ingo, E-N-G-O, and then Ingo, maybe. Ingo. Okay. Yeah. Oh, N-go, in-go. There we go. N-go, in-go. Okay, got it, got it, got it. Okay. Bingo, bango, bongo. All right, so let's let's do these. You ready? Boingo, boingo. Right. Oh, boy, here we go. Just uh, So somebody just uh, take this from this moment on, and you will have all the examples in audio format. Let's just go through them really quickly. These ready? are the real ones, too. These are the real yeah. ones. Let's go, let's just go around Robin. Sure. Uh, is there a one in particular you want to hit, Ben? Uh, well, sure. Uh, bingo. Stands for Business Friendly International NGO. Think of something like the Red Cross. ENGO, E-N-G-O. That's an environmental NGO. Think of Greenpeace, perhaps the World Wildlife Fund. I'm torn between this being my favorite or, or, or the, the, the number five, but we've got GONGO, a government-organized non-governmental organization, uh, such as International Union for Conservation of Nature. I'm sorry, Government organized, non governmental organization. <laughs> I swear to you, that's the real thing. That just means that means that a, that blasted right past me. <laughs> that means that a government said, "Okay, we're going to set aside money. We're going to give it to this place. We're going to start." You know, to your example, the International Union for Conservation of Nature. But then, you know, you all go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take the money and and run. Uh, and then we have Ingo, I N G O, an international NGO like Oxfam. And finally, Quango. I love it. A quasi-autonomous NGO. An example here would be the International Organization for Standardization, a highly important thing. I, I propose that we, uh, that we start an NGO to change the pronunciation of Quango to Quango. Oh. It just sounds so much more fun. <laughs> I feel like I know a guy. There must, there's a guy who lives in our neighborhood somewhere whose, whose street name is probably Quango. Then there could be the obvious Ted Nugent tie-in and call it Quango Tango. There we go. Oh, wow. God, I hope his last name's Tango. Quango Tango, if you're listening, that's just cool. We were just in Los Angeles, and I always think of that road that sounds Kawanga? similar. Kawanga? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's an outlier because it's like Sunset, Cosmo, and someone in the back is just like, Kawanga! <laughs> it's, probably, it's probably as 
create significance to somebody somewhere. My favorite Los Angeles adjacent uh, name for a town is Rancho Cucamonga. Yes. yes. Pretty fabulous. Yeah, it feels fancy just hearing it. Sure does. Uh, so all of these things, the the bingo, ingo, gongo, in, ingo, quango, quango, <laughs> they, all, they all get their money from a couple of easily identifiable places or types of places. Membership dues. You're, uh, you're a, a member of World Wildlife Fund or whatever. So every month or every year, you, you give them money because you want wild animals mm-hmm. to still be a thing when your kids grow up. And you get a really fancy, lovely calendar. Mm-hmm. Well, private donations. Uh, there's, a, there's a very clever thing that – oh, we'll go back to the second. The other two are the sale of goods and services, right? Buy this mug, buy this T-shirt, a portion of the proceeds, blah, blah, blah. And the other one is grants. You apply to a government or another organization. They give you money to accomplish a name. Going back to number two, private donations. The very, very clever thing about private donations – this may, may make me sound like a jerk to say it – is that it is not altruism. For a philanthropist to donate, sure, maybe they want to help that cause, but they're also saving so much money in write-offs uh, when they when they donate as much when they donate a portion of their own proceeds. Wait a minute. So is NPR an, uh, one of these? Well, it's definitely a, a nonprofit, uh, but I, I wonder. That's a good question then, because. It receives so much government money. It does, but it also does what you're talking about with the pledge drives and mm-hmm. the private donations and also lots of grants. You always yeah. hear, you know, this funded by a grant from the Johnny and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. The Annie E. Casey, the Annie Foundation. E. Casey Foundation. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Exactly. All the big ones. So even if it's not, it certainly functions in a similar way to some of these uh, NGOs that we're talking about. Absolutely. And as big NPR fans, uh, both on the federal and regional level, we just want to say we know that you probably don't like doing the pledge drives either so soldier onward folks you're doing a great job yeah but ben yes uh are these groups they sound eerily similar to those special interests people are always accusing politicians of pandering to that's right it's absolutely right because they are special interests they're Special interests just happen to be ostensibly, again, on the surface, beneficial. Uh, you are absolutely not wrong. They are very much special interest groups. I do want to. Uh, I do want to bust a scam real quick while we're on the concept of private donations. This happens all the time. If you go to your local grocery store, especially around the holidays, you know you're ringing, you're, you're buying magazines, dog food, and egg whites, and uh, I don't know whatever else, shoe cleaner. I'm getting a real picture of your life. Okay, continue. Duct tape, something to burn your fingerprints off, whatever. And then at the end of the transaction, they say, would you like to donate to this holiday fund? Would you like to donate a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, right? And they ask you right at the register. It's very easy to say yes. Here's what's happening with that. Those companies are taking that money that they're they're getting from individual grocery store customers, they're pooling it into a single fund, and they're using it to make a large charitable donation that offsets their tax burden. So what you're actually doing, what you're actually doing, now you are helping people on the way, but what you're actually doing is paying that grocery store's taxes for them. Man, Kroger, why would you do me wrong like that? I just, that's... I'm pretty sure that's what's going on. I would love to be wrong. I think that's called a loophole, Ben. And I don't know. that's what they're <laughs> they found it. But don't you feel like a jerk sometimes? <laughs> they're like, do you want to donate? And you say, no. You're, you know, what, what do you say? You're like, I don't want children to have toys. I think <laughs> dogs should just die. You know? I, yeah, no, I agree. I think the my problem, just personally, and speaking personally here, is that I am so embarrassed by the thought of denying a $1 donation at any point when someone points at me and says, would you like to donate? Uh, You're already paying. Just click this thing. Mm -hmm. I I have to say yes. So if you ever want to squeeze money out of me, Mm -hmm. just uh, make it seem like a charitable (laughs) donation and hit me while I'm doing a transaction. Do you um, typically give uh, handouts to um, panhandlers? I did. For a long time. Then what happened, Matt? Who hurt you? Uh, I just, ooh, I could tell you an actual story. I know, yes, we're going to take a break. Jeez, Paul, he's just staring at me. Is he doing the throat cut He move? is. <sighs> we're going to go to a break soon, I promise. I, I gave a gentleman in a wheelchair 
um, more money than I generally would. And then he got was, up and walked away, didn't he? No, he he took it, like just snatched it from me, and then just wheeled off really quickly. But was very much just like I got away with it, kind of thing. I don't know the way the way I felt afterwards. Um, and then I also went to I went to school at Georgia State in downtown, and I think it just. The interaction, that type of interaction occurs so frequently. You get numb to it kind of, yeah. Well, it's tough because if you want to truly help someone in that type of situation, just handing them cash that is transferable in that moment probably isn't the best way to do it. Many times that's going to be enabling perhaps mm-hmm. behavior that is already occurring. But again, I'm, I don't have all the answers. You know, you one thing you can do is donate to an organization like ones that we're talking about right. today, right? Yeah. But then you, you don't really know exactly where your money's going and probably only a small portion of it is going to truly helping those people. Anyway, blah, 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 blah. That's perfect. That's perfect. Okay. That's the point because <laughs> – what if there's more to the story behind these NGOs? Why do some governments want to ban non-governmental organizations? And what if the goals of these organizations on paper are not their actual goals on the ground? We'll attempt to answer some of these questions after a word from our sponsor. Here's where it gets crazy. So, you know, like like many of the things we talk about on the show, uh, things are not always as they seem. Uh, there's a problem here. It turns out that um, at least in a few cases, um, folks are quite right to distrust NGOs in the way that that Matt had the inkling of um, a minute ago before the break. Uh, Back in 1967, Mike Wallace, uh, the uh, seasoned television journalist, from CBS, CBS, Mike Wallace, led an investigation into reports of CIA front companies only to find that the, uh, the CIA regularly used front companies as a way to circumvent um, laws, domestic and international alike. Uh, for example, the 67 investigation found that the CIA um, was functioning under the title the Bureau of Public Roads. Yep, the so, BPR. Oh, yeah. Gosh, so it's all kind of a smokescreen. So let's, let's dig into this, um, starting with uh, intelligence agency Assets. So really quickly before we completely jump in, I just want to give give everyone the tools to look at this if they want to on their own. It was called CBS News Special Report with Mike Wallace, and the title was In the Pay of the CIA, an American Dilemma. Yeah, you can you can watch the entire thing on YouTube. We think it's very much worth your time. Also, keep in mind that all the disturbing stuff you hear about in that investigation, happened back in 1967. This is from the 50s to the 60s. And CBS News, one of the largest Mm -hmm. providers of information, uh, a media company, they were the ones helming this investigation and giving this information to the, the American public. Here's what they found. So the CIA created front companies. That's not It's not explosive news to anyone, but they use these front companies to donate to legitimate charitable organizations, uh, some of which existed beforehand, right, and some of which were also probably custom-made. Wallace characterized these charitable funds, these institutions and foundations as part of the country's financial power structure, and he's very blunt about it. Yes. He says these are large aggregations of private money. They are influencing policy and influencing culture with very few checks on their activities. Very – like when I say check, I mean checks and balances style. Very little oversight. Well, and it's 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 weird too because – as they're tracing these things, right, let's just give an example of something like the – it was called the Granary Fund, right? Mm-hmm. And it's this, it's this organization that takes money in directly from the CIA, right? And, and it's literally just money goes from the CIA to this thing called the Granary Fund. And CBS News tried to track down where this place was. And they found that, that it had an address in Boston, Massachusetts – at this one place in this one, you know, room or suite within that building, they got up to that suite and it was actually a law firm of Hemingway and Barnes. 
and the person that actually signs all the checks and all of the um, the financial and tax documents for this this granary fund was one of the major guys there uh, at this law firm who also happens to be a part of the CIA if you look him up. Right. And uh, who's who. And who's who. Mm-hmm. And then you realize that that granary fund is donating to all these other – uh, funds, you know, like charitable do, uh, organizations and true real life funds. And then you realize, wait, that money that those real funds have is all mixed in with this CIA money. And we're talking about thousands and thousands of dollars. This isn't chump change. And this is a great money laundering exercise. You know what I mean? Yeah. Car washes are for schmucks and amateurs now. <laughs> so isn't that extortion? Not extortion, fraud? I mean, if, if, if you, people are taking your money and then it's just going into this imaginary smokescreen pot? Uh, well, what do you mean, taking your money? You're talking about taxes? You're talking about donations. We're well, talking about donations. Well, in this case, it's the CIA funneling mm. money, taxpayer money into a fake account or a, a false uh, company, then that company is donating to a real fund. And then those funds get distributed okay. however the funds So it's not it. individual donations that are just going off into space. Like, but it is. It's taxpayer donations, essentially. Well, yeah, <laughs> right. well then the, that's just theft then. It's not donations <laughs> at all, right? I, I, think, I, think the question, I think the question here is, are NGOs bilking individual donors, right? Like, yes. Like Paul signs oh. up. Paul signs up for the International Institution for the Proliferation of Applebee's, and they want to build Applebee's in developing countries across the world. And then he finds out that his, you know, two hundred dollar a year donation is actually going to build Chili's or something like that. You know, uh, like it, if it's not doing, I think legally when you donate that money. Um, they can do whatever they want with it. And I, I think now I would like to say there's some more oversight for charities because you can see all these sites rating charities on their trustworthiness and so on. And there are a lot of other like predatory things that purport to be charities but aren't really. They just sound alike, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and they're there to, you know, bilk people out of money. Here's the thing. By donating through these front companies, the CIA specifically, other organizations did this too, the KGB in their time. They were huge fans of doing this. But by donating through front companies, the CIA is muddying the financial waters, making it increasingly difficult to track where this cash goes. And again, it is taxpayer money. And more importantly, what it is spent on. I mean, it makes sense. Think of it this way. Let's say uh, the four of us had, you know, no plans for the weekend, and so we decided to destabilize a region of the world or promote regime change in a country, but due to geopolitical worries, concerns, norms, laws, all that jazz, we cannot risk an open war. We can't just send people in to depose the leader. We can't have a hot war on our hands. Heck, we're at the point where, you know, we can't even get intelligence agency employees over the border as long as they are acknowledged to be intelligence agency employees. Because what we can do instead is get members of an NGO over the border, right? So now our operative, uh, Matt Frederick, uh, Matt, Matt, what's your spy name? Cranberry sauce. Okay, so uh, Matt Cranberry Sauce Frederick, operative Cranberry Sauce, uh, can't get in, but uh, you know, uh, Cranberry Matthews, the member of the the Red Cross or the Society for the Betterment of the Pangolin, can absolutely get into the country. I, I think it's actually Barry Cranston. Barry so Cranston. You know. yeah. There we go, and. This guy, Cranston, can, if he's careful, gather like-minded students from local universities, disaffected youths, the youths, uh, in areas with high unemployment, arm them with weapons smuggled in by someone else, teach them guerrilla tactics, and boom, you've got a quote-unquote student union. Slash rebel force. Slash terrorist group. <sighs> and so back in Washington, politicians can say, we morally support the goals of of this student union, spreading freedom, spreading democracy, uh, morally support only. We do not have 
an attachment to them, and that's when it goes to politi- uh, that's when it goes to plausible deniability. The president may really think that somehow in a country where uh, guns are generally banned, a bunch of college kids got together, got armed with uh, with military grade weaponry. And- uh, they had what started as a, a stand in or a sit down turned into a full scale rebellion. Right, 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 and suddenly. Just they, they pulled out of the top hat of their asses the most— Their ass hats? Their ass hats. Thank you. They pulled out the most effective protest and counterinsurgency techniques that the human civilization has discovered. They just made it up. Right. I mean, sell me a bridge then. You That's, know what I mean? That sounds so hypothetical, Ben. All right. Yeah, yeah. You know, Ted talking here, but this is not a hypothetical scenario. This happened in the past. This might be happening right now as we record this episode. And dollars to donuts, it's going to happen again in the future, much sooner than you think. In that CBS special, they did specifically track the granary fund donations that went through this little spider spider web of money flow. They tracked it to specifically student union foundations that were operating – uh, internationally. So it's just, it's already ringing true. Yeah. I mean, and I'm, I don't want to vilify everybody, you know, like students, student unions are doing things and, and grassroots groups are an important part of, uh, challenging authoritarian regimes, but sometimes they're not as grassroots as they appear to be. And it's, it's a pickle for sure. We actually have uh, we have many, many cases of NGOs and media outlets that are completely more or less independent. They're doing what they say on the label, right? Unfortunately, we have many examples of media outlets and NGOs that are controlled, infiltrated, or manipulated by intelligence services. Again, this doesn't necessarily mean they're bad. And it also doesn't mean we're going to talk about it right now because we're going to take a quick word from our sponsor. Uh, and special thanks to uh, that NGO that uh, was sponsoring us. Uh, maybe not. It's all Illumination Global Unlimited. You're doing God's work. Now that is a fine example of a non-governmental organization. That's true. That's, that's, just, that, that's just an N-O. <laughs> that's a non-organization? It's a non-organization. There we go. I'm a proud member of a non-organization. It's true, though, that maybe we're overemphasizing this a little, but it's it's all to the good. Of course, the vast majority of people working at these organizations are not inherently bad. They're not members of Spectre or something. In fact, it's plausible. I mean, it's almost certain that many, many people within these organizations, from volunteers to career staffers, have no idea there's any ulterior motive at play. You know what I mean? It's like you could work at the State Department and have no idea that the IT guy down the hall is actually a CIA asset because he just fixes your email. You know what I mean? Yeah. Is he? (laughs) And that, of course, doesn't mean all NGOs are currently fronts or even compromised, but it makes you think. It does make you think. Um, The collaboration between NGOs and intelligence services – is kind of, you know, like Bill Cosby in Hollywood in the 90s. It was an open secret. Um, in 2010, Joe McSpeeden, which is a great, a great name yeah. for an agency uh, official, um, for international development, in fact, um, he launched a social media messaging network in Cuba called Zunzunio uh, that was very much uh, resembling Twitter. And it was used by thousands of Cubans who were unaware that the project was actually designed to essentially infiltrate their their privacy yeah. and monitor their communications to, well, to get a sense of what was going on on the ground there in Cuba. Well, and according to the AP from 2014, it was also to stir up unrest within the, the country by affecting the populace. Um, like that was one of the goals of this thing. Uh, whoops. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or, you know, 
score depending yeah, yeah. on which side That's you really side messed you up on, you know uh yeah another example uh ben i know this was one of your favorites was the national endowment for democracy or ned mm-hmm. uh, which was funded by uh, the u.s congress yeah this comes to us from an investigative reporter named robert perry p-a-r-r-y perry writes that ned National Endowment for Democracy took over the CIA's role of influencing electoral outcomes and destabilizing governments that got in the way of U.S. interests. So do you have a left-wing, duly elected uh, president who's a little bit too uh, too leftist? Is this guy – does this guy have the nerve to nationalize that country's resources, their oil, their gas, their heavy metals, their timber? Or to alter the currency that is being exchanged for those resources? Yeah, you know what I mean? Uh, As far as – it seems like as far as the geopolitical apparatus is concerned, people can burn flags all they want so long as they buy those flags with dollars. U.S. dollars. (laughs) That's – I mean, you know, there's a case to make that the real flag of a country is its currency. What was the name of the – we did an episode earlier today, Ben and I, uh, on uh, Ridiculous History about Ernest Hemingway's younger brother who tried to declare a sovereign nation on a raft. And he had uh, a really cool name for the currency of uh, New Atlantis, right? Scruples. Scruples. The scruple. Oh. Love that. Because he, yeah. he thought wealthy people should have a lot of scruples. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, that's a, that's a true story. But this 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 thing we're talking about destabilizing governments, yeah, that the United States specifically the CIA has an issue with, uh, well, has an interest in, well, right? That, but yes, uh, for various strategic reasons, it's just it's rough that that's the avenue through which it's occurring through these supposedly you know uh, good organizations that are trying to do good. For our world, this is really bothering me, guys. You're saying you just think it's inherently icky and wrong. It feels very icky. Um, It's so cloak – I mean it is – okay, it's so perfectly cloak and dagger, I suppose. And yet once – you'd think that once it's found out that this kind of thing is occurring, let's say from those reports, that 1967 report from CBS, once that's found out, you'd think, oh, well – Maybe maybe that ended, right? We figured that out. The world figured it out. It's over now. Yeah, that's the thing, though. I wish there were a better response than, <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. That's a, that's a big oof for me, man. Yeah, uh, places like NED or organizations like NED, these kind of slush funds for foreign policy operations that are a little – that are not above the board uh, – This is a prolific practice and it's only a practice because it works. It's not like everybody chose a theme just for the sake of aesthetics. Mm -hmm. There's undeniable proof that the CIA has conspired and is likely conspiring as we speak to execute illegal campaigns in other countries using NGOs and charities as covers. Again, not necessarily the fault of the charities, not the fault of the NGOs. In fact, there's a case to be made that these innocent people may have their lives put in danger if one of these intelligence operations goes wrong. But, you know, with this being such an open secret, like you said, and with that 67 investigation uncovering so much of this cloak and daggery, surely, you know, sovereign nations are hip to this and don't want this kind of influence infiltrating their borders. Surely we would feel the same from NGOs from other countries, you know, masquerading behind this idea of do-goodery, this veil, right? Aren't there laws that would prevent this kind of stuff from happening? It's a good question. There are a lot now. Uh, before we – anybody in the more skeptical side of the audience relegates this to uh, the land of alarmism and uh, sensationalism and tinfoil hattery, note that other world powers are very aware of this strategy, have participated in it on their own. Uh, you can see again in that 67 investigation, uh, there's a little bit of whataboutism on the side of people who say, yeah, the CIA does do these dirty deeds them they're cheap to uh to uh to other countries but that other powers are doing the same thing like there's this um fantastic footage of a russian organized huge concert it was a blowout but it was it was all to make the great idea of cold war communism more palatable and to make it cool it was a war for the hearts and minds and 
We also know that people take this seriously because many other countries have made laws explicitly banning NGOs, foreign-owned NGOs, from their borders. Amnesty International was a very interesting source on this because they're, you know, they're pro-NGO. Like, what could go wrong, right? And they do great work. They say that governments across the world are increasingly attacking NGOs by creating laws that subject them and their staff to surveillance, bureaucratic hurdles, and the ever-present threat of imprisonment. And they have a lot of examples here, too. Yes, and we have a quote here from Amnesty International. It says, In the past two years alone, almost 40 pieces of legislation that interfere with the right to assemble and are designed to hamper the work of, of civil society organizations have been put in place or are in the works around the world. These laws commonly include implementing ludicrous registration processes for organizations, monitoring their work, restricting their sources of resources, and in many cases shutting them down if they don't adhere to the unreasonable requirements imposed on them. Yeah, so this could be killing people with a thousand paper cuts of paperwork, you know, like mm-hmm. you need a you need approval to assemble or to, to hold this meeting, right, to tell people about uh, the dan- uh, the benefits of sanitation or to teach people how to – if we're being totally, uh, totally benevolent about it, let's say you're trying to teach people how to operate and maintain a solar-powered phone charging station, right, mm. invaluable. That's great stuff. And then let's say – the country in which you're trying to do this doesn't care for your whole – the cut of your jib. And so they say, OK, to hold this class where you teach this, you have to get approval from this authority and that authority has to approve it uh, 60 days before you do this. However, that approval can only be submitted 30 days before you have the thing. So now you're in a catch-22 bureaucratically. Mm-hmm. It's, it's weird. It's a weird flex for sure, but we also have examples of specific countries who have started banning or excluding NGOs, make no mistake, because of these concerns that spies may be infiltrating the country via NGOs. So Pakistan's Ministry of the Interior uh, rejected registration applications from 18 international NGOs in October of 2018, um, and they dismissed all of the appeals that came without giving a reason. Uh, they, they, they are clearly very suspicious of these agencies just in general. In Saudi Arabia, the government can deny licenses to new organizations and disband them a step further even if they are deemed to be, quote, harming national unity. And this has affected uh, human rights groups, um, including women's human rights groups who have not been able to register and operate freely in the country. This is a really good example of like, you know, a couple of bad apples spoiling the bunch, you know Mm -hmm. I mean? Because as we said at the top of the show, clearly there is good work being done by these NGOs, but because because of a few bad actors, um, everyone – it's like, the, you know, everyone kind of gets screwed, right? Well, it's also a convenient reason to keep things as they are, hmm. right? Like if you're talking especially about women's rights groups operating in Saudi Arabia. That's absolutely right. right. I mean if you can just ban a group that is advocating for a certain thing – uh, because of reason A. Potential threat to our sovereignty or whatever. Yeah, yeah. you know, and, and that that phrase, like I'd love to get your take on that phrase, Ben, national, harming national unity. Oh, uh, yeah, oh, uh, yeah. I mean. Same-sex sa- equality is seen as harming national unity in Saudi right. Arabia. That's right. That's, that's kind of what we're talking about. And you can kind of see that at play, that kind of phrasing at play in countries across the world, even ones that you, you know, you may live in right now that you identify with as like having this equality thing down pat, uh, perhaps, perhaps it's not that way. That's right. I mean, the very basis of your national unity could be on the wrong side of uh, human rights in general as mm-hmm. a whole. Yeah. Those are veiled shade at the United States, by the way. Just so everybody's aware. Okay. <laughs> well, right. take off let's the continue. veil. Yeah. Okay. Let's in continue. general, but the uh, this is this is an interesting case, and I'm glad you brought it up because in the case of Saudi Arabia, yeah, there might be some uh, insidious intelligence agency activity going on, but it's also just as likely, it's more likely that a lot of those 
NGOs are getting shut down because they are advocating for things that in the West are seen as inalienable human rights. Belarus goes a little bit further. Any NGO that can operate in the country is uh, is closely observed, scrutinized by the state. And if you work for any NGO who tried to register and got rejected, you have committed a crime and you may be imprisoned. Uh, you may also just disappear. You should probably get out. Yeah. Uh, th- these are just a few examples. Other countries, Azerbaijan, China, and of course Russia, have introduced uh, more registration and reporting requirements. And if you don't comply, you can be thrown in prison, which is – It sounds weird, you know, to say that you didn't complete some paperwork, so now you're going to jail possibly for a long, long time, uh, especially if you're a foreign national, right? Because usually we think, well, if you don't do paperwork, right, you you get a fine for being late, you know? Um, Um, Yeah, unless it's – I'm trying to think of like a really bad traffic violation – where you actually end up having to go to jail for a couple of days if you don't fill out your paperwork, i.e. pay or show up. Sure, yeah. Uh, I guess for people on probation. Ah. That's paperwork that could get you in trouble. But we mentioned Russia. Maybe we bury the lead a little bit here. Russia is one of the most well-known anti-NGO organizations. They, a few years back, banned all NGOs that they considered undesirable. It's true. Um, The government has regularly labeled NGOs who receive foreign funding as foreign agents, um, which is a term that you could very easily correlate to uh, ones that are a little more direct, like spy, traitor, enemy of the state. Uh, The government applies this kind of thinking so broadly, not only thinking, actual legislation that even an organization that supports people with, say, diabetes actually uh, gets – could be subject to fines, um, put on a blacklist of foreign agents and forced to close. Uh, This is not hypothetical. This actually happened in October of 2018. Uh, Medical, environmental, women's groups – all of these have also come under serious scrutiny and, and, and fire from the Russian government. And all of these moves have really galvanized the developing world and launched uh, a kind of a renaissance of anti-NGO legislation. Yeah. And so for anyone listening now who has dedicated their life to service, thank you for being one of the good forces in the world, even though I, I'm sure at times it feels like you are outnumbered. Uh, If you're having a hard time trying to understand why these countries would so profoundly distrust NGOs, think about it this way. If you are in the U.S. or Australia or wherever you're listening uh, to this show, imagine how you would feel if there were organizations from, say, China or Russia or Iran popping up in the capital, popping up in your town and they were funneling hundreds of millions of dollars given to them by their parent government just to influence your local politics, right? So now now it doesn't matter how you vote because there is a new special interest group in town. They have more money than you could ever raise, and they have a bigger say even though they don't live where you live. And And even if it's not specifically influencing politics, but it's influencing some kind of social norm or movement, right? mm -hmm. You know, just that perhaps your immediate area doesn't agree with. I mean, that would be – that would be very strange if it was coming – if that money is coming and influence is coming from outside of your own country. That – it would certainly feel odd. And it feels like an attack on sovereignty, you know? Uh, This would, understandably, here in the U.S., this would generate a lot of anger if people were aware of this, especially if these groups tried to tilt an election one way or another. But suppose they weren't just trying to tilt an election. Suppose they had success doing that, and now they wanted to upend the system of government. This is something that the U.S. financed NGOs have done in the past. Or, sorry, people operating out of those NGOs. Again, the NGOs may have no knowledge of what's actually happening. 
and this has occurred numerous times. This is rinse and repeat because, again, it works. And the story is not over. Our only conclusion we can make is that NGOs are not going away. The CIA is pretty open about the fact that they dig it. They're, they're like, we, we like working with these guys. Yeah, they actually have a term for it. They, uh, they coin it deep cooperation between uh, the agency and these NGOs. And they uh, refer to this whole process as, uh, quote, information sharing, end quote. Um, yeah. So I don't know. It seems pretty unlikely that that's the end of the story. Yeah, yeah. I don't think so. Let's, let's really quickly, let's mention something that that CBS – a new special report talks about, and that is the Security Act of 1947. Just to give an idea of why, why the heck is the CIA operating in this way? Because as we learned back in, back in the old days in our school books, we learned that the Central Intelligence Agency is in fact an intelligence agency, and it is meant to carry out uh, what would be called intelligence in all the various ways we've talked about on this right. show n- numerous times. Human, SIGINT, et cetera. Yeah, it, gathering information, right? Um, but because of that Security Act of 1947, they were essentially ordered through this act to do a whole bunch of other things. And all of these things that they would have to do then and now are currently having to do are duties, quote, as directed by the president and his National Security Council. And – That phrase is so vague, it allows essentially whoever the standing president is and the National Security Council, whichever elected officials are in there, they get to direct the CIA outside of the director of the CIA or at least nudge very uh, harshly what they need to do and what they should be interested in. It reminds me of the term which I've always found weird and a little creepy, serving at the pleasure of the president. Yeah. It's yeah. like you're going to a Chick-fil-A. You know? Yeah. Well, and in that case, it doesn't matter who the president is because if you've got <clears> – <throat> we talked about it in an episode not long ago. But if you've got, you know, a security council with officials that have been on there for a long time uh, who see a big picture, who see the chess moves, I can only imagine what, what things occur, what, uh, what other countries perhaps should be very much aware of. Well said. And that's a great question. Are other nations right to be concerned? Is there a solution to this problem? Or has the money gotten too good? Is the system too effective? The question is not whether the machine is broken because, you know, there's an argument to be made that the people who are running this thing love it. It's doing what they want it they to do. They know exactly what it's doing and, then, and what their role in all of it is for sure. It, right. It reminds me very much of diplomatic immunity and functioning out of embassies. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking the same thing when it, in terms of the uh, the aid workers or whatever, or the NGO employees being able to get kind of carte blanche. Uh, that's that's the sort of the uh, root of some of these laws where they're like, no, you can't come anymore. We don't want you. We know what you did. Are you familiar with the term cranberry? Oh, uh, I know a guy named Cranston. <laughs> Lock him up. But we want to we want to hear from you. Uh, as we said earlier, if you have been if you have been abroad or here in the U.S. or in your home country helping out with a non governmental organization, thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you for making the world a better place. Because for Pete's sake, we need the help. Uh, and if you have if you have experience with anything sketchy going on in one of these organizations, we would love to hear from you. So, like the Peace Corps would be one, right? Yeah, a lot of people go to the Peace Corps. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's an upstanding, fine organization. Everything's fine about the Peace Corps. There used to be a statue for the founder of the Peace Corps in our old office. I remember. You know, that's where you that's when you made it. When you have a statue, that's a flex, man. So, if you want to send us any of that information, and you're not afraid to share it with us because of whatever situation you may have been in. Um, You can send it to us right now. You can find us on Facebook and on Twitter where we're Conspiracy Stuff. On Instagram, we are Conspiracy Stuff Show. Do the Facebook group thing if you want to have some more real-time chats with the community. Uh, It's called Here's Where It Gets Crazy. All you got to do to get in is answer a simple question. Name one or all of us or say some combination of of the witching words that Ben speaks into a dark mirror at night with the the ritual winter shins and all that stuff. (laughs) Did you catch? any rap lyrics or mentions that Ben or one of us may have put into this episode or previous episodes. Let us know. Any reference will do. Yeah. You can also give us a call 
We are 1-833-STDWYTK. That's, yeah, S-T-D-W-Y-T-K. If uh, you, you didn't get it there, you just type it in your old phone using those letters as numbers. And generally, there's a handy guide on whichever phone you're using. You can also leave us terrible jokes on any of these avenues. I want to shout out to a journalist friend of ours who's legit, a guy named Jared Alexander, who just said, what concert costs just 45 cents? Are you guys ready? You're not ready. I'm ready. It's 50 Cent featuring Nickelback. I wasn't ready. <laughs> oh. So, so you can send stuff like that. Uh, But if none of that quite bags your badgers, we still want to hear from you. There is one more way that you can always contact us 24-7, 365, 364 this year, days a year until we get black bagged or burned down. That's right, folks. We have a good old-fashioned email address. We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.